Hello, everybody. This is Aram Milkamov, and you're listening to yet another episode of the Product Innovation Series. Uh, today, I'm joined here with Tadas Laboudis, a Senior Director of Product at Playbox, uh, which is a workforce engagement management WEM solution. Uh, he used to be a founder of ProdSight, but after the acquisition, he's now back to being a team member leading the customer AI team at, uh, at Playbox. Tadas, uh, pleasure having you. Thank you for joining. Hi, Aram. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. So first question, that, you know, in your specific, you know, circumstance that I, I don't want to kind of start off with and ask is what's it been like your transition uh, after the acquisition of your company to now joining Playbox? Um, what were your kind of first impressions? You know, how did that um, how did that all unfold for you? Yeah, good, good question. And, and, you know, to be honest, before this all happened, uh, I didn't, you know, know what to expect exactly right so we all have assumptions about like how you know big companies were medium-sized and, and startups so a lot of my experience was in early stage uh up to that point uh Prozide was a small sub sub 10 member uh team and uh it's you know it was a, it was a roller coaster um so you know following about five years um of, of, of working on prod side uh, as my kind of like baby my product um you know the transition uh was pretty smooth because for, for the majority of part you know product is something that um that i love doing so you know i was a product manager before prod site uh that was like my primary focus at prod site I, I feel like if you build a great product you know, the rest will come. Obviously, I realized the importance of other aspects as we start to scale. Um, but for the large part, you know, what happened now is um, a lot of the additional things I used to do, like fundraising and, and looking at finance and sales and marketing, like as founders, we wear many hats. I've now uh, been able to shed most of them for the most part and focus on, on the thing that I enjoy, which is building great product. Nice. And so since since joining the company, have you seen there to be any, or has there been any kind of overlap or, um, you know, situations where what you were doing, you're continuing to do, or has it been like, you know, very net new for you? So, so I think, um, th this idea of, um, you know, whether you're an early stage company or, uh, you're at later stages, um, you know, we're, we're still, um, at the core of the company is the product, right? So um, whether, you know, it's something that you launched a while ago and needs maintenance uh, or new features being added, innovation to be added, um, you know, that's always, always there. And, and, and at the core, you know, if you don't have a great product, there, there's nothing for sales and marketing to do, right? However good they are. Uh, so I think the biggest overlap, the, a lot of the product work, I, I did the product site uh, in nature is similar um at playbox as well um there's some nuances which we're going to talk about um hopefully later on um where where it's different where you have more people involved you know it, it changes um how much communication overhead there is and, and and syncing on things and being on the same page um but for the large part i feel that my role um it, it's quite similar at, at the very core of it okay cool uh, last question before we move on to a, a, a new topic is, do you miss being the CEO? <laughs> How's that been for yeah. you? <laughs> that, that was my worry. And I think like um, what being a CEO means for different people is a different thing. Um, I, I think for me, being a CEO of my company uh, was a rewarding experience because there was a lot of freedom and, and kind of the buck stops with you. So there's no one to blame. For whatever happens, like whatever happened is is, is down to you. Um, so, so there's uh, there's uh, positive aspects to do with that. Um, also, also negatives like that weight uh, on your shoulders. So I think um, sometimes sometimes it can be too much. Um, so when things get hard, uh, you know, it had some very like low moments at prod site, uh, different points and. It's kind of nice to have a little bit more support now, uh, having different people doing different things. Uh, just because you're not being your 100% doesn't mean things stop working. So, so 
having that momentum of, of a company like Playbox, it's it's a really like mentally freeing thing for me. Uh, so I do enjoy the aspect. Um, and I think I've been very fortunate at Playbox to have a lot of ownership and 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 kind of freedom to to explore and, and do things my way and introduce new ideas. Um, so 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 far I feel like I'm reaping all the benefits, but uh, not getting much of the downside that I think a lot of people expect. Like after you uh, go to acquisition, like things are going to go downhill. Uh, that was not my experience. Nice. Uh, although I, I know it happens. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so the next series of questions I have is I want to learn more about you know how you do user research and what your discovery process is like. It's always a great question I, I, I like asking because you know occasionally I might find people do things a bit differently in certain organizations and it's very helpful for the audience to kind of like you know see what are the options out there so so let's start off first question is how does user research and discovery work at, at playbox yeah so the thing with playbox is has scaled extremely rapidly in the last few years and a lot of our product team members and and design members are relatively new to the company uh, so Playbox is about 10 years old. Uh, the majority of the product members are have been with the company for like two, three years um, and, and some some uh, fewer years. So we're still refining uh, a lot of the processes and templates of, of how we do discovery. Um, there is also uh, some differences. Some teams are doing their own way and some, some are doing more user research and discovery and some are more, I guess, uh, kind of like engineering led. Um, and, and that differs from product to product. Uh, I guess one of the things we are looking to do is introduce more uh, of this process and also templatize them more so that uh, different teams or new members joining the company can pick them up easier. Okay. And uh, in terms of uh, methodology, like what, 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 what process do you have around you know, doing user research and discovery from yeah, a so methodology not, perspective? That's a good question. I think... You know, we use a lot of different mental models um, about like thinking about products, thinking about what good design is, what good engineering is. And uh, so we're using a lot of different things. But I think if, if I was to summarize, I, I would pretty much say we follow the double diamond process. Uh, you know, it's lots of kind of like opening up, uh, you know, the, the problem space, like what can we do? What would add value to customers? Let's do like contextual inquiries and, and things like that. And then, and then narrowing down of like, okay, let's maybe solve this one problem that we feel is like going to have uh, the, the most impact and then doing design iterations, again, opening up to see, um, you know, uh, what are the different ways to solve that particular problem? And then again, uh, converging on, on, on the best solution through, through that process. So I feel like we do follow that and it's uh, obviously a proven uh, process that works for all companies. Uh, I wouldn't say that you're uh, religious about it, um, but uh, I, I, guess, I guess that would be our methodology. Okay. So primarily the double diamond, double diamond approach when it comes to discovery. Cool. Yeah, I'm very familiar with exactly. it. It's a, it's a very successful um, solution. Um, in terms of tools more specifically, what, what have you found to be useful for you to determine whether or not you know, what you release or uh, is successful? You know, how do you track um, like success, you know, from a product perspective. Wow. That, 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 there's a lot of impact there, but, um, in terms of tooling, um, we have found success with a tool called dovetail recently, and I found it's, it's quite an elegant and simple platform for, um, basically taking our, uh, interview recordings or usability session recordings and then turning them into insights. So uh, we we upload all of our recordings there. Um, we transcribe them and then code or tag them uh, with various themes and and then produce reports uh, for the other teams to to uh, to learn about. So that 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 kind of became um, uh, a big piece of our quality research, uh, like a, almost you could say a central repository of that research. Um, we also have another tool that our product management uses primarily called AirFocus. And this is, um, uh, it, it's primarily a road mapping tool, but it's more than that because, 
we uh, we prioritize and manage all of our different product initiatives, whether they are on the roadmap or might be on the roadmap. Um, we have a, a scoring system attached to that, and all of our product managers are using that, and, and it's also being used as a tool to communicate priorities or like what we are going to do as a product team or not going to do as a product team to the customer success managers uh, and and other stakeholders. So so those two tools, I, I would say, are at the center. Um, we do use some other stuff as well. Okay, cool. And uh, in terms of like an early stage um, approach that you take when it comes to discovery. So like uh, what I, what I want to kind of learn more about is say... Um, there's a new feature that you want to work on. How do you go about validating that feature with with your with your users? So, I think I like to think uh, about these things in terms of like what's a problem and what's a solution. So, if we come up with a feature idea, uh, that in itself already suggests that we we have a particular solution in mind. Right, so we, we want to build a feature. Maybe we've seen something similar in another product. Maybe a competitor has built something like that. So um, I think there's nothing wrong uh, with recognizing uh, features or, or like dreaming up things. That's what kind of gets us inspired to build things. Uh, but then I would uh, try and look uh, into the problem space and try and find the connections. So um, recently we used uh, a, a new approach um, uh, with opportunity solution uh, mapping. So we've, we've kind of drawn out this big uh, three in, in, in the Miro where we mapped out all the different problems that we recognized from research or customer feedback um, uh, that, that could be affecting our customers. And then we said like, okay, like out of those like 10 problems um, or opportunities, what are the different solutions we could build for each and trying to find alternatives, not just one thing, but, you know, maybe like you could build this thing and that could connect to that problem. And that helped us explore and lay out a lot of different uh, options, a lot more options than we normally would, because if you start with one feature, that's kind of already quite well defined in your head. And if you end up building that, you might have missed out on a better idea if you then back to the problem space and then explored alternatives. So, so that's how I, I would approach it now. And that's what we've recently done. Okay. And so ever since joining Playbox, you know, are you doing anything different than what you were doing at your own company before, or is it more or less the same? Um, it is different because at my startup, um, I was, uh, doing the sales. I was doing uh, the the product leadership strategy and and also working with the engineering team very closely, and I would do customer support. Um, we just didn't have the luxury of hiring everyone for each department at that time, um, so I feel like I could skip a lot of steps in documenting or like following processes to be able to get to the same result. So obviously there was fewer people to collaborate with. Uh, beyond our team to to come up with more ideas, which we have the luxury of a, a play box. But um, I was able to, you know, like one minute I might be on a sales call hearing uh, some some issues that customers are talking about uh, or a potential prospect. And then uh, I might be on a meeting with my team working through some feature ideas. And then, you know, I could be thinking about strategy at the same time. So you know, I could go through those cycles, like discover a pattern or a problem with the customers, integrate that into the strategy, and then work with my team quite quickly to make that a reality, or at least explore it in design phase. Um, While well, obviously, if you're working with more people and you have specialists in each role, uh, first of all, you're not as close to the customers, so you need to work harder um, to get close to the customers uh, by doing research, by jumping on calls, by listening to calls. Uh, by running surveys and, you know, soliciting that feedback. Um, but you also need to spend, you know, once you hear those insights, you know, that's only for you. So you've synthesized something in your head, you see something as an opportunity. Now you need to translate that uh, to other people in the company to get them on board. And I think there's more of that 
synthesizing things, presenting things in a way that could help others, get them on board, and then uh, you know keep them on board as, as, as you're progressing through a project. Um, there's more synchronization and communication that's needed okay. at this scale. Awesome. And um, last question around discovery, I want to ask is, what is there still left for you to learn in order to do discovery better? Like, what is that next thing for you that you want to try out that you haven't done before? Yeah, I think, I think with discovery, um, I think, I think it's something that we learn, uh, at work. So, you know, we have these leaders that, uh, really value good process and discovery that instill, uh, that in us. And then it feels like it's something within ourselves that want to do proper research and follow the proper proper process. Um, you know, for those that are not as fortunate to have had that kind of coaching early on, uh, I think it's easy to skip discovery or doing research and jump right into solution mode into this kind of like more tangible space. So, um, and I think this is a challenge for many companies as well as uh, in some teams of Playbox, which is how do we demonstrate the value of not skipping steps and doing proper discovery? Uh, what's the value of, of you know, carrying out a research study versus not doing one and going with your gut? Is there a difference there? I think demonstrating that, uh, demonstrating that going slower will get us there faster um, and, and how we build good products or, or building the right product the first time around instead of fixing it after. Um, so I think, so I think that's one of the challenges is, is, uh, elevating the value of discovery across teams. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is how do we standardize the processes so that the teams that buy into the process can easily adopt it for themselves. Um, you know, templatizing things, uh, having resource repositories that, you know, someone could easily get to speed with and also, uh, accessing other people's research for, for an example of how it could be done. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question that I have is around innovation and the pace of it. So I'm kind of I'm curious to know, you know, having your own company, you could kind of move as fast as you want, right? Do break things, uh, very little consequences, maybe, you know, still at the end of the day, but you know, at a larger company, um, have you seen that this is the pace of innovation has changed? Um, and if it did, what did you notice? Where did you notice it like first? So I think, um, again, this is something team from team to team, right? So, um, when we came into Playbox, we were very conscious of maintaining that you know, a secret sauce that we had, which is, I, I felt that we had like a certain velocity with which we, we could create things. Um, and I really wanted to protect that. Um, we have expanded the team and added more people. And then we've made sure that that's, that's still protected and, and scales. Um, you know, when it comes to interacting with other teams, like all of us come from different backgrounds and, and, and working practice. And I think, for, for any company growing, it's it's an it's only natural to, um, as you have more resources, as as you're as you're less threatened by the, you know, the possibility of everything, you know, um, basically going bankrupt and losing your business, uh, as you don't have that fear, I feel um, there's less of an urgency to to do things fast and and and, and make those like really painful sacrifices for speed, um, so. And also like as a company, as a bigger company, you need to, uh, recognize the importance of having like really strong security policies, like protecting data at a much higher degree than maybe you could afford to do at a smaller startup early on. Um, so, so I think there's good reasons why certain, uh, things take longer to implement. Um, and there's also opportunities where we can, uh, share practices and, and and kind of instill that urgency, but in a, a creating product in, in a fast pace. Um, I don't think there was a drastic change or, or, or anything like unexpected. Um, but, um, I, I think it's an ongoing challenge for us to make sure that we don't get comfortable. We don't get complacent. And if we don't like slow down, we're always, always keep hungry mm -hmm. because the market around us is moving fast. Right. So we need to, need to keep up. Mm -hmm. So, 
that's thanks for that response. My follow up question would be: How do you f- continuously foster or push the team in order to have that innovative mindset? Because you know you you don't want to become complacent, as you said. You don't want to stop innovation. So, how do you coach or mentor, uh, you know, and instill that level of innovation uh, that drives everybody? So, so, so that, that's a very interesting question. I think a lot of uh, teams are thinking about that things like that's this whole thing about uh, why startups can enter a market and then disrupt it and, and, and surpass the incumbents down the line. Um, so, so this is an ever present challenge. Um, how do I think this could be solved? I, I think it starts with teams. So look, we have this small team at Prodside. These individuals, like as we formed the team, they came from all kinds of sizes of companies, like large and small. Um, and then we built uh, our processes and and culture around, you know, this urgency of building product um, at a fast pace. So now we're coming into playbox. We want to protect that. Um, I don't see any reason why you couldn't spin up many individual teams that have that same DNA, right? Uh, I think what's needed is you need someone within the team. Um, it can be a product leader, but it could also be a technical leader or design leader um, to kind of act as that like engine and, and get everyone ignited around that, uh, uh, that, that, that value of speed, I guess. Um, and I, th- I think you need to keep those teams small, right? So the more people you have, the more synchronization needs to happen, the more cross-checking, uh, the more opinions are debating. If you keep the team small, then it's easier to get down to business and, and get things working. Um, and then the third thing I would say is 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 the cross fun- cross discipline cross functional aspect of it. So, if you have a uh, someone who's good at design, if you have someone who's good at engineering, and someone who understands product and business, um, that's a lot of like that. That's all the ingredients you need, pretty much, to to build any product feature or, or even an entire product. So I think if you have all those teams independently being able to function with, with relative freedom uh, to to innovate and create things uh, without having to sync with every every tech lead with every like product manager in another team um, and you're you're maintaining that DNA I think you um, that I think that's how you foster innovation um, I know at companies like Facebook um, I've been told uh, by a friend who works there that uh, they actually even have different teams that are building uh, competing solutions for the same problem. So, so, so that's again like having the freedom of different teams working independently, um, but then um, actually spinning up multiple teams to to be able to create competition and competing solutions um, to to drive that innovation. So, whilst not every company has the luxury of that, that kind of for me, cements that point that um, uh, the small teams are the way to do it. Yeah, uh, I've, I've heard that before, and I know that at uh, other companies like at Apple, at Google, they do the same thing. And so, like, people have no idea that there's a whole other team doing the same, you know, uh, new product or whatever it is. And I think it's great at the end of the day. If, you know, if Companies like that, obviously, they have to afford it. But I think it's a great way to create some competitiveness. And I don't think it's to make it, you know, from a bad lens. I think it should be reviewed upon like, okay, let's get like different ideas, right? To solve maybe the same problem. Maybe somebody will come up with something that, you know, has never been done before. Or, or you know, somebody did, saw, thought of something that the others don't. So I think it's good. Um, yeah, but- yeah. Um, okay. So let me jump into the the fireside format. So it's very you know quick question answer responses. Try to keep it to one to st- one to two sentences max. So the first question I have is how do you ask better questions in product? Yeah. So I would say don't uh, be aware of not asking leading questions. Avoid using them where possible, uh, and that will help you uncover how people really think. Okay. And oh, over the years, when it comes to product. 
or maybe just now and from a leadership perspective, what have you become better at saying no to? I think uh, it's easier for me to say no to scope creep and recognizing and just cutting it in the bud. Okay. Um, and then if, uh, as a product leader like yourself, if you could, if you were only, um, if you could, and were only able to work, say two to five hours per week on some activity, what would you do with that time? Um, I think I'd connect with my tech lead and make sure they have everything they need to move forward with what you're doing. Okay. And then uh, last question is, are there any kind of, uh, uh, books or, you know, resources or people that have greatly influenced kind of your life when it comes to product? Yeah, specifically for product or like discovery, uh, Mom's Test is, is a book uh, I really enjoy. It's a very short book in relative terms. Just opened my eyes to how to ask better research questions and uh, and really served me in validating some other ideas. Sorry, it's Mom's Test? Mom's test. Okay, cool. I've never heard of um, I've never heard of that one. Interesting. I'll, I'll check it out. Uh, we'll we'll link it in the in the episode. Um, uh, so that, that's great. I think um, that's a wrap. To dust. Thank you so much for uh, for your time today and uh, sharing all this knowledge with with me and the audience who's going to be listening. And always thank you to our listeners who uh, tune in and support us. So uh, no, thank you. All right. Thank you so much, to dust.